Hello and welcome to episode three of Royal Nature. Thank you ever so much for all the footage, videos and messages that you've been sending in. It's been fantastic to see how you've been inspired by the nature in your local area and telling me about how you've been noticing things more, which is wonderful. Today's episode, we're going to have a look at ponds and I'm going to show you how you can build a small pond in your garden if you don't have one already. I'm going to show you how to get the best out of ponds in your local area. So we're going to go exploring with a GoPro, an underwater camera, and hopefully just show you some of the things that you might see in and around your pond. Now, it's a huge topic, so we can't cover everything today, but I just want to give you a little taster of the difference that ponds can make to your garden. Before we get started, I'd like to just show you some footage that's been sent in by our viewers. And first up, we have JK in year three and Louis in year one. They have a huge garden and are really lucky that it's right by the canal in a beautiful setting. So let's have a look around their amazing garden. I am Louis. And I am JK. And we're going to be we'll showing show you around, around our garden. garden. Um, firstly, let's, let's look at the flowers. The flowers. Okay. We also okay. have a tree, an apple tree, right now, now should be growing super duper, it should be growing lots and lots of flowers. You can see that there's um, a field over there, with lots of horses, with, three horses. with some horses as well. That's all from me and Louie. Bye. See you next time. This next bit of footage has been sent in by Sienna in year five and Sire in year three. And it shows a blackbird having a bath in their sand and water play pit. And it just goes to show if you put water out for birds, either to drink or to bathe in, they will come. And you can see what a good time this blackbird's having. I think it's brilliant. Let's see. These photos have been sent in by Harry in Year 7. He's lucky enough to live near a canal and he often cycles along there as part of his daily exercise. Harry also sent in these photos of mallards. You can see the female on the left and three brightly coloured males on the right. The canal is often a wonderful place to see all sorts of wildlife and we'll be doing a feature on canals in a future episode. I'm going to hand you over now to Mr Whitehead. He's our special guest presenter for today and he joins us from his garden talking about amphibians. Hello, Mr Whitehead here. I hope you're well. I hope you're safe. I hope you're getting some uh, exercise during these days, whether it be out in the local countryside on a walk or a bike ride, or maybe even enjoying your time in the back garden like we are. Before I begin, I want to thank you and I want to thank Miss Mulvey especially for getting this project up and running. It's, it's great to see the way that you're all getting involved with this, the way that you're commenting, sending in your pictures and, and the projects that you're doing. So keep them coming in. I think they're really good. They're great to, to watch and, and to uh, see what you're doing over these uh, days and weeks. You probably guessed, but I, I want to spend a few moments talking to you about amphibians and some of you have probably studied these sorts of uh, creatures before, maybe at primary school, maybe you've got a pond of your own, uh, or maybe you've just done some work, um, I don't know, maybe as a school project. What, uh, what we've got here are some, some tadpoles that we collected from uh, a pond when we were having a walk at the start of the Easter holidays. Amphibians as a word comes from the Greek it's either going to be the Greek or the Latin with science, it's, it's always those two. Um, and amphibians are no different. The word amphibios is, is a two-part word. Uh, bios means life. It's where we get the study of biology from. 
um, and amphi means uh, of both kinds. So what we've got here is both kinds of life, which is really what we know about amphibians. Uh, the tadpoles are actually just a larval stage, so they are aquatic. And uh, these guys here, you can see them swimming around. Uh, they're going to be like this for a, a couple more weeks and then they're going to start to turn into uh, one of the amphibians that we know about. And I think, I think if you ask anybody what they know about amphibians, they'll probably start talking to you about uh, either frogs or toads. These guys here, <clears throat> they're going to turn into frogs or toads and the way that we can tell, I don't know if you can come close and have a look, I don't know if you can see in this light, but as you get very close, these tadpoles here have got little gold flecks on their body surface. Those gold flecks tell me that they're going to turn to frogs rather than toads. If they were going to turn into toads, the whole body would be black and they'd be fatter. I think most people are aware of frogs and toads as being amphibians, but um, not everybody knows the difference between a frog or a toad. Um, it's quite easy to work out. Frogs have got smoother skin, they're a lot wetter as a skin, and they've got longer legs. Toads are, are fatter, they're, they're a squat organism, and they start to crawl around with their shorter legs. They've also got dry um, and quite warty or, or bumpy skin. So these are going to turn into frogs, um, and they're going to do that by a process of metamorphosis. That really is just um, talking about a change that they're going to go through and that change is going to become uh, the adult frog. Also in that, um, in that gill pouch will be the front legs. A lot of uh, this one here you can just start to see the back legs starting to form but the front legs will, will start to form at the same sort of time. Um, they're just hidden from view early on. Our fingers um, used to be webbed when we were in the womb and, and the cells between our fingers were pre-programmed to die off before we were born. It's, it's a similar sort of thing that's going to occur with these tadpoles as the tail starts to disappear as the, the hormone level builds up. So over the next couple of weeks, they're going to keep changing. The, the back legs are going to become really apparent. The tail's going to start to disappear and we're going to get these, these very small frogs starting to form. I think at that point we're going to have to take a, another walk back to the local pond and put these back in there. So there we go, um, a potted history of amphibians. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, let us know if you've got a pond maybe in your garden, you've got some tadpoles on the go um, or anything else. Give us some comments, send in some pictures, um, but most importantly do keep in touch. Um, maybe have a go at presenting as well, I'm sure you could do a better job than I can. For now however, Thank you for watching. Take care. We'll see you again. Bye -bye. Now, I'm really lucky to live within walking distance of the local nature reserve. And at that reserve, there's two ponds. Here's a photo of one of the ponds. And you can see in terms of plants, it's very diverse. There are submerged plants under the water, marginal, and a huge range of trees and shrubs. These provide important habitat for all sorts of organisms. This is the beautiful marsh marigold, Caltha palustra or king cup. Palustra means marsh and Caltha means cup or goblet, literally goblet of kings, because of the rounded yellow petals looking like a golden goblet. It provides important cover for amphibians and provides an early nectar source for pollinators, so it's a really important plant. So a couple of days ago I went down to the pond in my nature reserve and had a go with a GoPro and underwater camera and I'd like to show you how my son Alexander in year three got on for the first time having a go with one of these impressive bits of kit. A really good way of exploring the pond is to use a waterproof action camera like this GoPro or you can buy very cheap disposable waterproof cameras. It allows you to explore the aquatic world in a whole new way. Here you can see Alexander demonstrating how to use the GoPro with a monopod. It's best to use slow, steady, sweeping movements and try not to touch the bottom of the pond, otherwise you'll disturb sediment and you won't get a clear shot. An important thing to consider if you are exploring a pond or using an underwater camera is that you're aware of waterside safety. It's also crucial that you don't disturb any wildlife. Right, let's have a look at some GoPro footage.
So we were quite unlucky on this day. The pond was quite full of sediment and it was quite murky in places, so we didn't actually film anything too exciting. Nature exploring can be like that. Sometimes you get lucky, other times you don't. It doesn't tend to take away from the enjoyment though. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some really good GoPro footage that was taken on the same camera, but in a different pond on a different day. Now, some of you might have noticed that we haven't actually talked about a particular type of amphibian, newts. And if, like me, you love newts, then don't worry, we'll be doing a whole episode on them very soon. Here's a sneaky peek at our upcoming episode about newts. It was filmed with the same GoPro, but in a different pond. In that episode, we're going to be looking at the different types of newt, how you can spot them and how we can help protect them. Ponds can be big or they can be small, but they're really important for wildlife. They provide habitat, places to feed, drink and give shelter. If you have a pond in your garden, it will bring a whole host of wildlife in. I'm going to show you an activity now where you can build a small pond in your garden. You can build a bucket pond. You either need a small bucket or washing up bowl. And first you need to dig a hole and place the bucket inside level with the ground. The most important part of the pond is always the shallow parts or the marginal areas. So use stones and logs to build a gradient. This allows the water temperature to be warmer. It also means that if organisms fall in, they can easily climb out. You can see there's a whole host of plants that you can use. So for example, hornwort, spiked water milfoil and submerged pondweed is really important as it oxygenates the water. Finally, I've surrounded my pond with wood and stones. It looks nice, but also provides habitat and shade and protection for invertebrates and other creatures coming to the pond to drink. My cat Evie loves our new pond, but we've also seen an increase in invertebrates, in flying insects such as bees and hoverflies, birds have been coming to drink, and we've also had more visits from our badger and foxes, which has been brilliant. I'll show you footage of that in a later episode. So I hope you've enjoyed learning all about ponds today and the sorts of creatures and plants that can live in and around them. And perhaps you'll have a go at building your own bucket pond or maybe you'll like to have a go with a GoPro camera or underwater camera if you ever get the opportunity. Either way, I hope you enjoyed watching and please send me any footage to do with nature or ponds. Perhaps you had a go at getting some underwater footage yourself. Just remember, stay safe, particularly around water. Make sure you're supervised by a parent or adult and have fun. Take care. Bye bye.